um, present for the Feminism and AI Workshop. Um, I, um, my name is Dr. Kelly Stone and I am going to be sort of facilitating today's discussion. Um, very quickly, just in terms of housekeeping rules, um, I think that for purposes of connectivity and just distraction, if everyone can mute themselves and also um, turn off their camera um, for the time being, uh, that'll be um, a easier way for us to kind of manage all of the uh, various things that we uh, Kelly, you're on mute. Oh, I'm just chatting away and on mute. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks, Tuli. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Kelly Stone. It is an absolute honor and privilege to welcome you all to today's Feminism and AI workshop. Um, just before we kick off, because we've got a very full agenda, if I can ask everyone um, who is not presenting or speaking, if we can just mute ourselves. Um, and if you want, you can turn off your camera, you can keep it on. Um, it always is nice to kind of see people's faces, but I think that for purposes of making sure the presenters are not distracted, it would be great if people could actually perhaps shut off their camera for the time being. Um, so before, as, as we slowly start letting people into the room, I just want um, uh, everyone to know that uh, the purpose of today's workshop is really around building a collective construction on what feminist AI means for the global South. And then more specifically, reflecting on the relevance and utility of the Global Index um, on Responsible AI to feminist-led initiatives in Africa, Latin America, and India. Um, also, today's session will be conducted primarily in English, um, but there will be simultaneous translation um, to Spanish and French. This will be when we're in plenary. Um, so if you would prefer to um, listen in either Spanish or French, you can uh, click on the interpretation icon um, at the bottom of your screen and select the channel that you would like to listen in. Um, also just kindly note that the um, translation is only available in plenary and when we split to break our rooms, it won't be available, but I'll make an announcement um, when we do so. So today's, um, so as, as I mentioned, um, it's a real honor and privilege for me to be um, hosting and, and introducing this, this really important uh, workshop on behalf of the Global Index and Responsible AI and with support from Data for Development um, in really kind of ensuring that the Global Index on Responsible AI is a tool that is both relevant and useful to local initiatives. Um, being done across the global south on promoting feminist feminist AI. So, as a um, as a person who has had the honor and privilege of living in Africa for the past um, twelve years, I will also just say that it is an absolute uh, privilege for me to share today's platform with a a group of really prominent um, and impressive uh, female leaders, as well as a, an, a, and a male leader that we have amongst our, ourselves today. So we have a packed schedule. Um, we're gonna be hearing from um, Professor Paola Requarte um, from uh, the Institute of Technology in, in Monterey. Uh, we're also gonna be hearing from Nakatula Oloranju, who is a researcher at uh, Research ICT Africa. Um, both Paula and Tuli will be um, leading the opening present presentations uh, today. And then during our breakout sessions, we're gonna be having three breakout sessions. The first, uh, there will be one um, representing initiatives in the Africa region, and that will be uh, featuring a presentation from Bridget Boyaki, who's a Ghanaian entrepreneur, as well as a data scientist and the policy lead for the Tony Blair Institute. Um, and that discussion will be facilitated by Huguet Diakabana um, from the Aspen Institute. Then we'll have a breakout session that um, is uh, highlighting the work being done in India. And we'll see a presentation from Nandini Ch Chami um, from IT for Change in India. And that discussion will be facilitated by Dr. Ravashi Aneja from the Digital Futures Lab. 
And then we will have a breakout session uh, featuring the work that's being done in Latin America. And that will be um, a presentation from Associate Professor Jamie Gutierrez Alfaro from the Institute of Technology in Costa Rica. And that discussion will be facilitated by Dr. Marielle Zasso, who is an AI researcher. So an impressive lineup we have today in a packed schedule. Um, so with that, what is the purpose of today's workshop? Well, there are kind of two ways that we want to begin framing and articulating that. First, what do we as the host presenters and facilitators want to give you the participants? Well, first, we want to critique, provide a critique of the assumption that AI is gender neutral. We also want to introduce you to a set of tools that have been developed for assessing efforts by states as well as non-state actors to creating the conditions for socially responsible and ethical use of AI, specifically from a gender lens, as well as exposure to the work being done across the global South to amplify and expand feminist approaches to AI. And what do we wanna get from you? Well, we're really looking for your participation and what we want to essentially build, which is a collective construction of what feminist AI means in the global South. We're also really interested in getting feedback on the relevance and usability of the draft gender indicators, which you'll learn more about today, um, for specific feminist AI initiatives on a local level for the Global South, looking specifically at potential gaps, areas for deviation, opportunities for improvement, sources of measurement, et cetera. And the real reason that we want to do this is because oftentimes when global standards and global benchmarks are, are developed, they're often developed um, in a way that kind of pushes down and has a top-down approach. And oftentimes local initiatives feel like they're in a position where they need to be reaching up to conform to a set of standards that they haven't necessarily been involved in the development and conceptualization of. And one of the key objectives of the global index on responsible AI is to make that it's as relevant as possible to everyone. So we are trying to flip that approach on its head, recognizing that it's not going to be a perfect fit, um, but we're going to do our best effort and then really see what kind of document we can produce that is as relevant and useful to a wide range of stakeholders as possible. So with that, let me kick off, do our first interactive exercise. I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation and I'm now going to go into a quick mentee exercise. So um, let me just make sure as I'm trying to see here. Okay. So for those of you just quickly, um, Zara, can you see the mentee on the screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with Menti, Menti is one of my favorite tools. It's a great way to kind of kick off discussion. Um, you can, um, the way that you can participate um, in this discussion, we wanna sort of begin thinking, or what are kind of three words that come to mind when you think of feminist AI in an effort to really sort of begin building this co collective construction of what feminist AI needs to mean for the global South. So you can, access and participate in this activity by going to menti.com either on your smartphone or even in your browser and then typing in the code 9890-5215 to get access and so we can begin sort of thinking um, about what this means for for folks and in, in the participants so go ahead oh equity excellent oh who get i don't know if you're in the room and i don't know if that came from you but what a fantastic word to begin um, uh, this conversation. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Amazing. Equity, equitable, decentralized, democratic, neutral. So what's so interesting as I was having, we'll hear from Hugh Get later on, but we were having this really interesting discussion um, earlier today where we were talking about the difference between discussions around gender and discussions around feminism and really the, the focus on feminism being fundamentally committed to this idea of equity. So already we're seeing these kind of notions around power and accountability and power dynamics and, 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 and disrupting, disrupting kind of notions of where power is held and um, where it can be centralized. So this is so 
fantastic. We see so much of this idea of, of feminism and AI being grounded in these notions of, of power and equity. Also, I'm seeing collaboration and fairness and inclusivity um, and really around kind of being pro-social and decentralized. There's also this real focus on empowerment. Lots of people are talking about accountability, also seeing dignity, transparency, it's fantastic. Oh, amazing. We're gonna build a beautiful collective construction of feminism and AI. So I am mindful of the clock and I know that we have a lot happening here and this, but please, continue to populate this. I'm going to stop sharing my slide, but the, but the mentee will stay on. So please continue to, to populate it if you'd like. Um, and with that, Paula, I'd love to hand off to you to hear your, your really important input for today's discussion. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm super uh, excited to be here. I'm super uh, honored to, to have the opportunity to talk about uh, the work that we have been doing regarding feminist AI. And um, I'm going to share my presentation. Um, do you see my presentation now? Yes. Yes, well, we can see um, it. thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be very brief because we the, pro the purpose of this workshop is to have the opportunity to, to talk about uh, what do we think about feminist AI, how can we achieve together a feminist AI, and why do we need feminist AI. So um, I'm just going to share some ideas, some, some um, visions that, um, that we have around feminist AI, and then um, of course, the, the the chance to to talk about this is what we um, what we are aiming for. Um, and now I'm going to begin with this quotation uh, from Maria Galindo. Maria Galindo is a, an activist, a queer activist from Bolivia, and she says that uh, you cannot depatriarchalize without decolonizing, and you cannot decolonize without depatriarchalizing. And for me, it's important because when we speak about feminist AI. Usually, um, well, sometimes, <laughs> not usually, but sometimes people uh, forget that we also need to decolonize AI. So for me, this is a process that needs to be taken into account as a, uh, a whole issue. So as, as Kelly was mentioning, um, AI is a matter of power, and that's why uh, we think that we need to talk about power when we speak about AI. And the figures that we have actually in, like in this moment of history is that AI industry is contributing to the deepening of systemic inequalities globally. And, and for me, one of the, the things that I'm most concerned about is uh, that we are, sometimes we are um, thinking about the harms that AI can uh, cause to, to people but we usually focus on some specific aspects of AI. So for me, the first question is, if we want to speak about AI harms, then we need to think about AI as a global phenomenon. So as a global phenomenon, AI reproduces dispossession through data extractivism, global algorithmic social orders, and automated impoverishment. So for me, there are three processes that come together to produce uh, violence at scale. And these processes are datafication, algorithmization, and automation. And these are, for me, epistemic processes, but um, they cause material um, harm uh, with AI, hegemonic AI. We are causing um, harm uh, to specific populations uh, uh, globally. So, of course, uh, First, we need to understand what's the problem. And then as feminists, uh, we are trying to find solutions for that. So we have the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And one of the goals of the, S uh, one of the SDG goals is of course, uh, the achievement of gender equality as a crucial um, uh, 
aspect to achieve other sustainable sustainability goals. So uh, gender equality is at the center of uh, the reproduction of violence and also it's at the center of these processes of um, dispossession and extraction because women's bodies and uh, the territories that the uh, population of the global south occupies are a part of these um, are part of these objectives of dispossession and extraction. So one of the um, problems that we have is that when we think about AI, we usually think it uh, think of it as a technology that is disconnected from the material processes that need to happen in order to um, AI to come to life. For example, AI needs of course, uh, material resources needs uh, minerals uh, and also needs labor that is usually not uh, well paid. And also needs a supply chain that consumes a lot of um, energy uh, and a lot of fuels. So Paula, when... Paula, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I noticed we haven't seen your slides move and I'm not sure if this is intentional. Oh, wow. No, I have been passing my slides. I'm so, so sad. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't <laughs> know. I think it was, I, anyways, oh. I'm, I'm very sorry, but I just wanted so to let you know. You didn't see any continue. of these? Oh my God. No, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but anyways, please, please. Um, oh I think it's fine if you want to pick up where you left off, but I just wanted to let okay. you know. <laughs> sorry about that. Can you see this slide? Uh, this? Yes, yes, I can see you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, okay. Um, so uh, the question is, if we think about AI as 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 this industry, but also as um, a technology that promotes certain uh, relationships between human beings, but also uh, between human beings and objects, and between objects themselves, because if we think of, about uh, the IoT industry, we of course have. Um, technologies that are communicating uh, among themselves. So if we think about AI as this whole ecosystem, can we prevent AI from being a tool to amplify control, exclusion, and violence? So for me, that's that's the question, but we need to think it again in these different um, uh, scales or levels, at the micro level, at the meso level, and at the macro level. And uh, as, we, as I said before, for us, feminists is uh, the question is: Can we build a feminist AI? So uh, we need to consider the full AI cycle. We need to consider all these layers or all these dimensions at the macro, meso, and and micro level. But also, we need to consider harm in a short, medium, and long term. Um, so, what technologies are built uh, should be one of the questions: By whom? For what? who benefits from those technologies. Uh, if, and the benefit, uh, I think that the benefit should be thought as a benefit in long, in long terms and long-term benefit. And who pays the cost for uh, this AI development? I usually uh, use this diagram. It's not like, <laughs> it's not a big deal, but uh, I like to, to use this diagram to, to um, but for the idea that we need to consider all these layers and all the complexity of AI and not only one aspect, one How, small aspect. Sorry to interrupt you again. Oh my gosh. Paula, but it, the slides are still not moving. Um, I'm not, I don't know what's happening. I'm so sorry. Is it, is it? I'm on désolé. I'm sorry. It doesn't, so I don't. I don't, oh, so yeah, I don't, I'm not quite sure, but um, I just wanted to let you know, I don't know if you can do a manual, uh -huh. it looks okay. like you are trying to do a manual click, but I'm not quite sure why it's not. Yeah. It's not working, just, but you can yeah, see now the diagram. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. we can see it so exactly. Okay. Okay, well, um, maybe I, I will just finish with the diagram and uh, well, for me, um, then if we want to achieve gender equality, uh, social and, and environmental justice, we need to decolonize and depatriarchalize AI. 
moving it away from the circles of capitalist accumulation and from colonial and patriarchal relations. So we need to consider every dimension of the AI cycle uh, if we want to achieve uh, autonomy, social and epistemic justice. Um, so I will finish there. I'm sorry that the, the presentation didn't go through. I don't know what happened. Um, but um, here are some references uh, of the work that I uh, have been doing uh, to think about this. And, and the point here is that there's not one feminist AI work because we, we don't want to achieve consensus. We just want to, um, to collect all the visions and uh, the needs that the population of the world has around the feminists um, that we need and the, uh, the technologies that we need and, um, and the vision of a feminist AI that allows us to uh, achieve a dignified life. And that's it, thank you. Paola, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but I think everyone had a, I think you did a phenomenal job setting the scene of why this, not only this work is so important, but why these conversations are so critical and that we can't talk about one without addressing the other. So thank, many thanks. And then what I'm hoping is what we can do is circulate the presentation that you put together because there was a lot of effort that was put in, um, put, put into that um, presentation and it's important for setting the scene. So before I, I hand over to um, Tuli to present on the uh, Global Index and the draft gender indicators, I just wanna make a note of something that I forgot to mention at the beginning of my apologies, is that we do have a sign-in sheet um, uh, that, and I've put a link to the, to the document, the Google Doc. So um, we please ask that you, that you add your info here, um, I mean, in the doc, and that you also let us know if you wanna stay informed of all of the um, important work that we'll be doing on the Global Index going forward. So with that, uh, Tuli, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'll switch on my video for a short bit, but I have to switch it back off before I start my presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noctula Lorenju, go by Tuli. I work for Research ICT Africa. And I have the pleasure and privilege of sharing on the global index on responsible AI as a tool that could potentially help address some of the issues that uh, Prof. Paula just discussed with us. And I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, Kelly, please let me know when you can see it. I can see it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so like I said, we're building on some of the points made by Paula about the role of uh, feminist AI and de deconstructing issues of power. And the global index on responsible AI is one tool that might help that for different countries across the, across the globe. But before I start talking about the global index. I want to paint a picture for everyone here. In the past five years, I'm sure you can count on your hands and feet how many frameworks and tools you might have come across on artificial intelligence. And I'll just give you a glimpse. And these, this is just a snapshot of the tools that exist right now that look at artificial intelligence. And these tools include frameworks, they include toolkits, they include, include uh, principal documents. But I want to highlight particularly two uh, thematic areas, inclusivity, design and diversity, and gender. And if you notice the gender in pink is quite small in comparison to the rest of the thematic areas. And the same can be said about inclusive, inclusive design and diversity. And in spite of all of these two, uh, frameworks and tools that exist, there are still gaps. And this is where the global index comes in. So what are those gaps? The gaps are the fact that a lot of these tools are predominantly developed out of the global north. 
So they do not take into account the primary data that exists in the global south. There's limited data actually that exists in the global south for these uh, frameworks. And these tools also don't take into account the emerging country capacities, the available resources, for instance, that countries might have towards developing artificial intelligence responsibly. But most important to this is that human rights are not central in a lot of these tools. So issues of gender equality and related to that feminism and AI are not highlighted, you know, and non-discrimination, those things are not necessarily highlighted in these tools. And this poses a problem. So essentially, we don't have something that comes from the global South that represents the global South. And we don't have something that is central to human rights issues as a tool. Now, what is the goal of the Global Index? Global Index is advancing the use of AI, which promotes and respects human rights. And as well as it's essentially measuring the commitment countries have and the evolution of responsible artificial intelligence, implementing principles that have been established. Two principles we highlight in the Global Index are the OECD principles on AI and the UNESCO recommendation on ethical AI. The reason we chose those two is because they are the ones that have been accepted by most countries around the world. And they are not just centered and their focal points are not just necessarily on the global north. And they include issues of gender, they include issues of inclusivity and diversity of experiences. Now we do this in the global index from three particular lenses, the governance aspect, the capacity aspect and the use aspect. Because say for instance, a country has you know, laws and regulations in place that attempt to, to further gender equality, but they do not have the capacity to do that. Or for instance, a country has practical use cases of AI being used responsibly, but perhaps the governance aspect or the capacity aspect has not caught up to the responsible use cases that exist. So we want to have a comprehensive picture for people to look at a particular country and see that, okay, responsible AI is in place here. Now, the objectives of the index include the realization of the principles that I mentioned earlier on through implementation, evaluation and monitoring and accountability. So the index wants to give evidence to decision makers and policy makers and legislators around the world in, on how they can advance the responsible use of AI and promote human rights. Be that from taking an example from a particular country and they like what exists in that country and it's applicable to their context. You hear me say context a number of times, I'm trying to emphasize something, bear with me. Um, so how was the index designed? We took into account these principles in the design of the index accessibility and openness, meaning that the index has to be accessible to everyone, not just uh, people, the government, people, government officials or the government itself, it has to be accessible to nonprofit organizations, to research institutions. And it has to be simple and transparent in that if the data that we have used is taken by somebody else, they are able to use that data appropriately and clearly. And inclusion and participation is what is happening right now, in the sense that the index wants a collaborative and co uh, sorry, a co-created and collaborative design and, and, and implementation in the sense that it has value to you guys as participants uh, in this workshop, that you can take it, you can explain it, and it makes sense, and it's useful to the work that is being done. Now, this is to emphasize the perspectives. The reason we have inclusion and participation is to emphasize the perspectives of underserved and marginalized groups and communities. Now, perhaps you might ask, okay, those in underserved and marginalized communities don't have the resources to you know, come to a workshop of this nature. So, I mean, how is this useful to them? And my response to that would be, 
a lot of you belong to organizations, a lot of us rather, belong to organizations that interact with underserved and marginalized groups frequently. And we know what matters to them and we know what matters on the ground. So we want your, your, your assessments and your reactions to the Global Index in order to incorporate not just your uh, perspectives, but the people that you serve, the people you work with and their perspectives. And lastly, the Global Index wants to reflect local contexts and realities, meaning that we all come from different uh, histories, realities, backgrounds, but the index should be able to meet you where you are and help you in the realization of human rights or assessment of the realization of human rights. Now, these are the categories of human rights that we've chosen. Uh, they are quite broad and they uh, are cross-cutting. So gender cuts across issues of labor, issues of community and cultural rights. Gender and equality and non-discrimination is what we're discussing today. But the reason why they are broad is that we can funnel and narrow it down based on the different contexts. Because say for instance, with um, individual liberties and democratic values, we look at issues of safety and security, issues around governance of artificial intelligence versus governance by artificial intelligence, which is when, you know, public officials have abdicated their powers and authority to AI. And with business and human rights, that's closely related to labor. So, but in each category, it, it's broad, but then we begin to narrow it down to what matters in our indicators. Now, moving specifically to why we're here, the gender equality and non-discrimination um, indicator. Now, the areas of assessments that we initially identified relates to anti-discrimination, to the digital divide, to inclusivity, and the promotion of women and underrepresented groups. But key to all of these areas of assessment is the inclusion of intergenerational BIPOC and the LGBTQIA and non-binary persons with different contexts and histories and cultures. So key to all of these areas of assessments that have been initially identified has to be the perspectives and the experiences of people from diverse backgrounds. So um, a table will be shared with our participants today. And this table, this is just a snapshot of the table. This is not the complete table. This table shows you the relationship that we have drawn between the pillars that we've assessed, the governance capacity and use, the, the type of indicator that this represents and how it maps with OECD and UNESCO. Now, I'll use the first uh, row as an example, because I want to highlight the aspect that the global index is not assuming that artificial intelligence is a golden key and a you know, be all and end all solution for the problems that happen on the ground. That is why we chose to emphasize the fact that laws and policies on gender equality and non-discrimination without AI have to have been established in the country that is being assessed because AI can either widen the gap that exists or it can bridge the gap and help realize the human rights that we, you know, that everybody is entitled to. So what do we want to get from participants today in our breakout groups? We would like a collective construction of what feminist AI means in the global South, i.e. to your context, to your country, to your, based on the history of your country. And secondly, we want feedback on the relevance and usability of the global index gender indicator, especially as it relates relates to feminist AI initiatives across the global south, meaning is it relevant to your work? Are there potential gaps that you've identified? Are there opportunities for improvement? Are there sources of measurement that you think we should include and haven't included or that we should emphasize more than perhaps others? So we want your first impressions. We want your input. We want to create something that's useful to you in the sense that you can take it. And as we build on it in the years to come, it's something that reflects the Global South perspective 
but doesn't necessarily, you know, neglect or push out the Global North perspective. So it's a complete collaboration. And I'd like to end the presentation here and say, please reach out to us, you know, send an email to the address, reach out to us on social media. And, you know, um, with the table that I, I shared with this table, we're leaving it open for input. Comment on it and let us know what you think. And based on that, we incorporate the comments and the feedback we receive and we use it. And thank you, I hope I haven't spoken too much. <laughs> Tuli, thank you so much for that. Really great overall picture of what not only the Global Index is attempting to achieve and do and create, but also narrowing down specifically on the gender indicators that you've been working so hard on and have been doing such a great job on, um, but also, again, kind of explaining how this process feeds into this broader process so people know that, you know, their contributions really do matter and are contributing going forward. So thank you for that. Um, what we're going to do now, I know that we're running a bit behind schedule, um, so we'll try to make up, we have some buffers built in, but what we're going to do now is split into breakout rooms. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there were going to be three rooms um, where we're going to kind of explore the relevance and utility of the global index, but specifically the gender indicators as currently drafted um, to the um, to the work that's being done locally in the region. So for those of you who are interested in listening to what's happening in Africa um, from uh, the presentation from Bridget and then participating in the facilitated discussion with Huguette, you can stay put. There will be both French and Spanish translation available in this room. Um, then if you are interested in participating in the discussion about what's happening in India, you can go into breakout room, which you should all have access to picking which breakout room you want to go to. I believe the India Asia room um, is number two. And so you can click on that. Um, and then if you are interested in, in participating in the discussions and listening to what's happening in Latin America, you can please um, pick that room to go into. And just so you all know that that, will, that session, well, not unfortunately, but will be conducted entirely in Spanish because interpretation isn't available in breakout sessions. So with that, please, uh, make your way to your breakout rooms and uh, facilitators and presenters. I'll kind of check in with you um, in about 30 minutes to see where things are going and then we'll bring everyone back to plenary if that sounds good. Okay, so uh, I think with that, you can kind of make your way um, to the groups. Is everyone able to move? No, I don't think no, so. I don't think yeah. So. You have I... to assign groups. You can't, you can't just move yourself. Okay, I was under the, oh, I think it looks like, oh, wow. Can we not do this unless you're unless you're a co-host? Okay. Um, now, now we can choose. Now we can choose. Okay. Now you can choose. Is that correct? I'm sorry. I don't know how to choose. Um, Which button should we push? So you should, should be able to. Um, as far as I know, if you can go into the, yeah, I'm also struggling. Kelly, I don't know if everyone has the same option. So if we scroll down, you can see the India, Asia, and then Latin American women. And there's a, I can see a join button on my side and that allowed me to join. So I don't know if everyone else has the same and option. And I'm wondering if you were allowed to join because you're a co-host. Yeah. What? Well, if you find that option, I didn't see it. 
I'm wondering if she has that because she's a co-host. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm wondering what, okay. Um, what should we do here? Um, is it possible for us, Zara, can you assign people um, to rooms? Yeah, I can, I have that option. Okay, I think we're gonna have to, can you assign ran, people randomly to rooms? And then if you are in a room where you don't, you don't understand the language, will you please message uh, Research ICT Africa and we'll reassign you to a different room? I'll start assigning now. Okay, is that something that you can do quickly or is this something that, do you have to do it manually? Um, seems manually. Okay, I see. Uh, I'll help you with that. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Again, please accept our apologies, everyone, um, for the technical difficulties. It's okay. These things happen all the time. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> okay, thank you. I mean, yeah, to her. <laughs> okay. okay, so also... Um, there was just a suggestion here that if people add their name to the room that they want to go to, uh, that will probably make it easy for Zara to also um, uh, do it manually quite fast. Um, so please just bear with us, everyone. And again, we're very sorry about this. Um, just quickly, I do see that, uh, okay, we are, um, Tuli did put a link to the table in the chat, the Google doc in the, that she presented on in the chat. So, um, while you're waiting to kind of get assigned to your room, if you want to take a, take a look at the link, um, to the table that may also be um, a good way to kind of prepare you for the discussion going forward, um, just so everyone knows. Thanks. Uh, Kelly, I think perhaps we can start in this room, since the plenary session is the African room. Um, and then people can send messages if they choose, or if they want to be assigned to a different room, to Zara or to Research ICT Africa. Thanks, Shuli. Um, So I am due to take the presentation for this session. Should I go ahead and start? Yes, please. Thanks, Bridget. Yeah. Sounds good. Alrighty, just getting my presentation up one second. No problem. Okay. Okay, uh, so thank you so much uh, to Lee and the rest of the Research ICT Africa team for this opportunity to share a bit about our work um, and to provide some perspective on uh, sort of the Africa region and how we think about feminism and AI. 
Um, I want to start off uh, with a brief introduction to myself and provide some context as to how I see uh, the gender indicators in the global index um, and a bit about just the landscape of, uh, you know, AI, women, feminism in Africa, and then kick off into our reflection or specifically my reflection on the gender indicators. Um, so uh, I specifically work on AI policy, so I will be coming from a policy lens sort of looking at how the gender indicators will influence um, government policy, how civil servants and, and advisors and people who work with governments uh, will think about the indicators. So in that sense, my reflections will not be exhaustive. Um, that's why I'm really excited to have you get in the room to facilitate the discussion uh, with the broader team who will come from diverse perspectives um, and can share a bit more about the nuances and, and perspectives from industry, civil society, et cetera. Uh, I do also want to mention um, before I go forward that um, you know, I'm very mindful that I, I I have personal context in the Southern African region, being Ghanaian, being based in Ghana. Um, our work allows me to have scope uh, of the Africa region because I lead the AI policy work for Africa. But I, I in no way intend for the reflections to be, you know, to speak for a whole continent. I don't think I have that in-depth perspective of regions, um, specifically outside of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So really looking forward to to hearing from people who have those more nuanced perspectives from, from those regions as well. Um, and I think it's important to mention that, that restraint in, in this uh, or constraint in this reflection. Um, so my, on my side, I'll start off with again, talking about, there's so much to talk about when it comes to feminism and, and AI in Africa. And I, I believe I saw favor from policy. Um, some of you may know of their work. They've been doing a lot of primary research in this space. Um, you know, there's so much to say about AI in Africa, but I'll, I'll sort of limit it to three core things of, in terms of how I see the landscape and then offer how the landscape influences the ways in which I look at the, the gender indicators that truly shared with us. The first is that I believe that uh, in, in many times when we talk about feminism and AI, um, uh, it's, we tend to erase the contribution of African women historically. Um, because AI is sort of viewed as more nascent to the continent and, um, you know, in, in that sense, especially given uh, the lower participation of women developers and such, um, it's, it's sort of viewed as something that's, that's being brought to us. Um, but I like to look at my work within the broader context and expanded the language of feminism and AI a bit more broadly to think about ethical innovation. And in that sense, we've seen, um, you know, for centuries that African women have been the stewards of um, ethical innovation. Um, and when I say African women, I, I understand that when we think about feminism, we're thinking more broadly about sexes um, outside of the male women binary as um, Dr. Paula discussed, uh, but I'll just use women for simplicity in this context. Um, but, you know, for me, that's, that's first and foremost, to acknowledge that African women have been in, in this space. I especially think of Wangari Mathai, um, as we talk a lot about climate innovation and the, the contribution of AI in, in, in this space um, and what AI can do for climate. I think of Wangari Mathai and her work leading the Green Belt Movement, mobilizing um, action in uh, way before it became sort of mainstream to think about um, climate and sustainability. Um, more recently, we think of people like Timnit Jebru. Um, and traditionally, it's like, you know, when we think about Africa's contribution to AI, we don't think about African women in that diaspora. And from Timnit Jebru to Joy Bjornamwini, there's so many African women who, outside of the continent, have deep ties to the continent and continue to, to from past till today, continue to, to lead and now thinking about what um, responsible and ethical innovation looks like. The second context I like to reflect on in my work is sort of, you know, then knowing the history, like applauding the history of African women in this space, I like to think about the state of African women in AI and in AI governance. Um, the first metric is uh, to look at women in, in AI, um, the AI workforce. The second we think about is like women in education as it relates to STEM and the third is women's political participation. 
Um, as we see the numbers here, they're about a quarter. Uh, it's, it's not huge, right? It's by no means, that's the word that came up in the menti was parity um, and equality. Um, it's, it's, it's by no means equal, but I, I, I see it in two ways. One is to acknowledge the presence of women there so that we don't minimize their contributions, um, especially in Africa, but two, to then use that as a motivation to advocate for more resources for these women and for these gender di diverse people. Um, given where I sit in policy, I like to think about the political participation of women as an integral part in, in sort of pushing the responsible agenda because not only will the decisions be made by the developers themselves, but by how policymakers shape the environment um, within which AI lives. Uh, the third is, I won't speak too much about this because I think everyone in this room probably knows so much about it, um, about the ways in which, you know, AI shows up on the continent, but a misconception I often face in my work is the idea that, you know, the AI doesn't affect Africans or African women because we're not sort of, you know, at the front of the Front edge, front edge, sorry, of technology, um, and and for me, um, you know, we as we all interact with global technologies, right, and global tech platforms, we're all impacted uh, by these tools. And I've cited some examples here. I know in um, some of research ICT Africa's work and policies work, there's so many examples in which we see African women's participation or African women interacting with AI. Um, and I think Dr. Paula has mentioned the ways in which even within the supply chain from, you know, the labor in terms of data labeling, et cetera, all of these things touch and interact with, with, um, with African women. So no way should we discount um, the impact of AI on the continent or on gender diverse people on the continent. So then I'll move uh, very quickly into my reflections. Um, it'll take very, a very short time. Uh, my hope is that it's, I sort of provide a framing and how I'm thinking about it from the policy sense and then open it up to hear from everyone else um, through who gets uh, discussion. But my three reflections are, I really appreciate the, the indicators that um, you get in, sorry, that Tuli and team chose for this because I think when you think about um, gender and when you think about responsible AI in particular, I think it gives African countries something to aspire to. And a lot of my work, I have to think about um, the indexes because I'm supporting governments in uh, taking a, let's say in, in um, adopting AI and thinking about the AI opportunity. And a lot, of, a lot of time governments will say, well, in all of the indexes, African countries fall behind. Right, but I think responsible AI is a place where we can have uh, spaces of regional excellence. Um, it's it's not a competition, really. If you're trying to uh, do something that has to be context specific, and I think responsible AI, and given the metrics that um Tuli mentioned in terms of having things that reflect the social context and realities in in the country, is really important, and that's an opportunity for African governments to shine. But in order for that to happen, I think the indicators definitely have to sort of move away from the Western gaze, again, to expand the language on um, to expand the language on what responsibility means and what uh, inclusion means, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be specifically on AI, but on in, maybe within the African context, we'll use uh, vocabulary around innovation um, and transformation. My second reflection is that um, progress is better where tracked. Uh, I think there are opportunities for improvement in the in the index where instead of saying, for example, and I'll show you very, very quickly, instead of saying um, uh, our frameworks, you know, well, let me just say this and then I'll show it, I'll show you it in the example very quickly. So I, I let me put a pin in this point that I believe that we can make greater progress on the African context by moving away from a mention of frameworks in um, a mention of certain, you know, language in frameworks to track in where uh, sort of the implementation of, of those um, initiatives are. And then thirdly, I believe African policymakers should be a part of the gender indicators when we look at um, inclusion um, and diversity. So very quickly, these are, I took the, the uh, table that Tuli shared and I wanted to just pinpoint some examples. Again, I think the 
the indicators are great. I'm just pinpointing three examples within the Africa context where I think they can be further strengthened given um, sort of where I sit. Um, when I mentioned here, for example, that frameworks address gender and non-discrimination and uh, AI. I think within the Africa context, we tend to have a lot of frameworks that will mention diversity and inclusion. Um, but to really assess where we are, we need to go uh, beyond just a mention or addressing to uh, assess whether the framework um, or the country collects data and statistics on digital inclusion aspects such as internet penetration, especially along the gender lines. Um, and, I, and I think if we're looking for it, it's going to inspire more Afri African governments to begin collecting the uh, this gender disaggregated information and data that's going to help us make meaningful um, impact in this space. I'll rush through this last bit, the, these last two for the sake of time. Uh, the other example I picked out here um, was around the, the point around the policymakers and their, their incredible impact on decision-making. And I think this is actually a space where African countries have the opportunity to shine. You have about 20% of African women being policymakers, but when you look at uh, the amount of African women who are data protection commissioners, ICT ministers, et cetera, the percentage is around 46%. Um, so if we include metrics that are sort of, um, uh, if we can expand this to include policymakers, then I think it allows Africans to shine on, on this uh, specific area, given that they're leading and in, in, in having women be in this uh, decision-making roles. And then the third is, I believe I, I spotted an opportunity here, evidence of efforts to support marginalized communities and adopting AI. I think here, um, again, maybe to my point um, on measurement, um, I think here we need to sort of look for whether um, the countries are looking, are creating local, are creating assessments that allows us to measure uh, diversity and inclusion and also local content in AI de deployment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll stop here and um, let me see what, what else do I have here? I can come in on these points later, but I'll stop here for the sake of time. I would love to hear from everyone else. Uh, this is my contact information at the Institute and I would love to, love to stay in touch, but I'll be in the room as well to, to hear the discussion and to hear from everyone else. So thank you so much. I hope that wasn't too rushed and um, it was useful framing and I'll pass it over to you again. Thank you so much. It was far from being too much. It was, it was wonderful, actually, just getting us going. I think one of the key, a lot of great points, um, Bridget, that you've made, uh, but one of the key things is reminding us all that as a continent, we're not starting from zero when it comes to innovation, because that's it, you know, if we think we're starting from nothing, we come into this space very differently, sort of, you know, the African humility that sometimes stops us from really contributing our best work. But if we know that innovation, we have played a role in different areas with um, the innovators that you mentioned, Wangari Mathai, especially, you know, when she was the reason I knew that I could do something to change whatever I, you know, it wasn't anyone else, it was her. Um, and, um, and, and I, I heard of her while I was still a child in Congo. So um, um, just to open it up out there, uh, putting some questions, again, we're here, we want to, you've given us great tools to help us start thinking about what feminism in AI means for us as a continent. Um, you've you talked about, again, in addition to not forgetting past contributions to innovation, um, the story that's being told about innovation, AI in Africa, um, is, that a, is that story made of information we contributed to the narrative? Uh, or was that, was that uh, is that story narrated based on data other people contributed and are telling our stories and how is that going to impact us or how is it already impacting us with like something as simple as the google search for black women i've never i've never thought about our professional hairstyles but you know i search hairstyles for black women of course the same ones show up and without thinking about it being thought of as unprofessional so putting the question out there to, to everyone considering um these points that Bridget has made, starting with the fact that we're not starting from zero, that there's been there's a history of African women contributing to, to innovation. How does that change anyone's perspective 
um, looking at that, looking at the role of women in the AI space. If we can have, there is some, uh, I know that there were people who messaged me that they weren't able to type messages to everyone. If that is still the case, let me know. But otherwise, um, if we can have people raise, is everyone able to raise their hand to, um, so that we know you want to speak? Otherwise, I can also, I can also call. I know that um, favor you wanted to, you wanted to say something. Do you want to come on and and make your point? Um, I I don't actually have very much to say. I just wanted to say that. I resonated with what Bridget said during our presentation. That's all I, I wanted to say back then. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for emphasizing that you, and, and I see Angela, you have your hand up. Please um, jump on in and let us know what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm it's middle of the night here, so I, I jumped in when the meeting was on and thank you so much, uh, Bridget, for such a great presentation and it, it, it's, it's a beautiful one. Um, I, I'm just wondering uh, as, in as much as are we also thinking in terms of uh, how we, we, we bring data or even we tag the discrimination bit of it in terms of the African air styles, okay. I captured that particularly because that uh, was my point at entry. I was also wondering whether we, we, are, we are thinking in terms of where are these common spaces where the repetitive data of what an African woman is coming through? Because I want to believe that it is about what is fed to the AI, what is captured, um, and what is now made reference to is African data of African women. So where, where are these algorithms that are picking uh, these unprofessional air styles? Where are they dominated? Where are they concentrated? And, and I think for me, I think I find most of them in Facebook. So I'm asking ourselves, where are we finding women in, in, in that context? Are women more, um, are women, African women, concentrating their data in the social spaces? Uh, is there where they are directing themselves and by default for lack of information that I as a woman, uh, professionally, I will appear, I will not appear with my image but I will appear more with my image in the unprofessional spaces. And that is now when the AI algorithm can be able to capture me better. And would I call that self-discrimination or would I call that the AI is learning by default because I am not the one going to the space, one. And then two, are we thinking in terms of AI of, uh, looking at now those self-imposed biases or those self-imposed, uh, um, I, I mean, as, as African women, who, how do we look at ourselves? How do we, what are those layers happening within our culture that are actually informing what is happening within the AI space and all that? And the third thing is about the design because I hear a lot about uh, discrimination and um, what do I call it? happening at adoption level. And for me, I hear a lot of narrative around receiving, receiving, the, uh, receiving and adapting or receiving and adopting technology. Have we ever thought about, how about how it is? How is it designed? How do those social aspects of the designer come into play uh, when uh, they now are being adopted by the African woman? And 
generally in the African culture and all that. So for me, I, I think there is a lot that we need to scratch deeper and understand. Yeah, because I, 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 I am just, I just want to understand whether we are, we are getting into those particular layers of, 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 in, of inequality and layers of discrimination and actually sometimes layers of self-imposed discrimination in terms of AI. Thank you so much, Angela. And I think I'll, um, Bridget, maybe you can speak on some of this. What I, what I got from um, Angela, you're really uh, reminding us to look at, so the data that AI is being trained on, um, how is it being accessed? And be, for us to, for African women especially, uh, to think about where, we're, if we are contributing data, where we're contributing and how is it, and then what happens when once we contribute data in these common spaces. Um, and the other question you raised for, that's interesting for us to consider as well is the, how much of what we, what's being reflected back to us um, uh, uh, and involves our sort of internal um, beliefs about who we are and what our role is in, in, in this space. And then us, us understanding a bit more how these things come about um, and, and with that, how much would that help us uh, best contribute to, to this case. Uh, I'll come back to you, Bridget, so you can speak, because I know you, you spoke about the policy, but in I think that's one thing we have to remember with the African context, the policy isn't so far removed from the social and cultural aspects, right? So I think I heard a lot of culture and social factors um, coming out of what you were discussing, even though the objective was to discuss policy. So I'll come back to you. And then Iman and Fasayo, you both have great comments. Uh, once Bridget shares with us her thoughts, I'll call on Iman and then Fasayo to come next. Over to you, Bridget. Thanks, thanks, Hugo. Um, perhaps I, I'll turn it over to uh, I, I. Most of what I want to say, I think, has been reflected in um, Iman's and uh, Fisayo's uh, bit and Rachel. Just so that I don't take up so much speaking time, but I'm um, happy to come back in after they share as well, if that's okay. Thank you, thank you. That's perfect. Um, Iman, over to you. Would you be willing to share your thoughts with the whole group? Iman, uh, let me know if you're able to unmute and share. And uh, Rachel, I see. Oh, I, I, Iman, I see you're, you're unmuted. I'll let you speak. And then, Rachel, I see your hand up as well. Please go ahead, Iman. We, we're listening. Oh, yeah, we can't hear you. Maybe there might be an issue with, uh, with audio. Um, let me uh, move over to uh, Fasayo and then we can come back to you in case uh, you're able to figure out what the issue is. Fasayo, would you share your, your question and then your thoughts with the group? Yeah, um, I want to confirm if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Bridget, for sharing that with us. Um, so building on the question that the former speaker had also spoken to, I wanted to just add, um, um, my question on how do we right the wrongs, um, especially narratives that is being perpetrated by, um, you know, by us, um, biases that we see around data set for AI, because, you know, looking at AI, they, they thrive on data and where are we really sourcing this data set from? And then um, the wrong data sets that we have, do we just like take them out and then start thinking of, you know, starting this things from scratch? Um, because what I hear Bridget talk about is, oh, we are not starting from zero, which is like awesome. But how do we ensure that all of these um, narratives that we currently have in the in the system or society at large, it is, it is, um, I, I think the word is, it is, it is being restated just about um, uh, coming up with new narrative that just takes out this one, and then we are able to see that the AI that we have is that which works for for women or just engender the agenda of women um, much more than you know the 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 downside of it that we can say. Um, thank you for that question. I'll leave it to everyone to sort of process that. And I think um, hearing 
sort of the subtext there too is do we is there something else sort of before we start talking about correcting the narratives with the data as it's reflecting already existing social narratives is there something else we need to be doing um, sort of si simultaneously in terms of to correct the narrative um, and rather than just focusing on what data is reflecting back to us I um, I'll move over to Rachel and then I'll come back to you, Iman, to see if you're able to figure out um, the audio issue. Rachel? <coughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Huguet and, and Bridget, for your presentation. I, I missed some of it because I was in the other group, but I really wanted to skip over um, to, to this group. Um, and I wanted to just respond to a couple of the really kind of important points that have been raised. So just quickly, Viseo, one of the, so just to kind of say that I am part of the, the team on the global index, but as maybe you can hear, there's a little baby in the background and I've been on maternity leave for a couple of months. So I'm coming back into it and I'm not, not as far ahead in the conversation as, as some of my colleagues are. But um, one of the really difficult things that we were trying to grapple with is how do we address a concept that's more like substantive gender equality? How do we right the wrongs that are already existing? How do we measure for or design indicators that capture the efforts that are being made or being conceived or being conceptualized to enhance women's empowerment with AI, to enhance gender equality. Um, so what is AI being used for? Is it being used in ways that uh, address kind of issues that are pertinent to, to, to gender equality, um, sort of things like maternal health, um, or, or that kind of thing. So that, that, was, that was one of the kind of areas where we were in some ways struggling to think about how do we design indicators that fairly capture or at least some way capture what needs to be done from a substantive point of view so rather than um, non-discrimination that's often thought of as something that states have to refrain from interfering in, 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 in people's rights that they have to actively take steps and put kind of budget behind in order to facilitate the realization and enjoyment of particular rights in a, in a substantive way so that that was a one point and then back to this 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 notion that Angela had raised and 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 it's particularly important in the context of this framing of feminist AI where we're thinking about all the systems, planetary, people, uh, mineral level uh, that, that contribute to creating artificial intelligence and the whole kind of life cycle of, of AI. This question of what is in the data and who is contributing to the data, is this something that is important to capture under the gender and non-discrimination cluster of indicators. So this might be something like, do we need to have an indicator that looks at questions around how governments and states are looking to address the digital divide and ensure that more women and gender minorities and underserved groups have access to internet technologies and are therefore contributing to the internet-based data that is creating AI systems. So I just wanted to kind of put those out there as, as points in response to some of those um, discussion points that had already been mentioned. Thank you, Huguet. Thank you so much, Patron. It's good to hear um, your voice and the sound of the baby in the background as well. Uh, we've, been, we've talked a lot of, of points that have addressed what, what we're thinking of, uh, what feminism in AI means. Um, it will be, uh, we had, a, Athanasius, I know you had your hand up and then put it down. I don't know if it was because your point was already addressed, but the other question we also wanted to, to, to hear about is whether or not um, this work with the index, you know, Rachel just um, said a bit more about what the reasons behind this work. If, if this work is going to be as you, you, you expect it to be um, useful and relevant to your specific context, it'll be uh, well, if, if no one else has uh, Athanasius, I'll leave it to you to, oh, there's a hand up, okay. Uh, uh, yes, Bridget, I wanted to say, if no one else has something, it would be great to hear. 
your perspective uh, on the relevance and utility of this work. And then just a note, in three minutes, we're going to go back into the main room. So I'll ask uh, Bridget and then Athanasius to keep your comments um, brief so that we can hear from both of you. Over to you first, Bridget. Thank you so much, thank you guys. Um, to keep it brief, I there was a question around uh, sort of the self-imposed, um, uh, I don't know if I'm capturing that right, uh, but the idea that African women ourselves may be contributing to some of this bias. And I think that's why it's very important in the indicator that there is um, an indicator on whether they're training programs on gender and non-discrimination in AI. Because the, the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, as Iman said, uh, be, before there are, you know, before AI becomes self-learning, it, it has to, the data has to be labeled by people. And it's important that both from developers to policymakers understand their implicit self-imposed biases and how that affects the, the deployment of the technology. So in that sense, I, I do think that the indicators reflects that understanding that, it, you know, just because we're Africans and just because uh, we may be women or gender diverse people, doesn't preclude us from also being uh, sort of perpetrators or advocate, sort of advancing these biases ourselves. So it's important that everyone gets that training um, irrespective of where they are. Uh, the other bit that came up was, was around the, the data set question. And I think um, Rachel uh, has responded to that at length. Um, um, the last thing I want to say on the indicators is, you know, from the policy side, it's when you look at all of these indicators, it can seem overwhelming for a policymaker. You speak to policymakers and it's like, well, there's so much to do. We have to train the developers. We have to assess whether they're women in, in um, sort of supporting the development of government-based AI programs, et cetera. I think in the Africa context, and it's very important that we sort of look at the low hanging fruits, right? So um, maybe having everyone have access to the internet at this time, for an African policymaker may be very difficult to achieve if you think about some of the economic challenges a lot of our countries are in. But what isn't going to be difficult to achieve is whether you know um, you're ensuring that all of the all of the um, AI startups who participate in government programs have uh, women um, on their teams or something like that, right? Something that is not um, that is not sort of dependent on other players like the private sector or something that um, doesn't require a lot of heavy lifting on the economic side. So that's my spiel. I, I, I would love to hear from people on this, whether they're low hanging fruit we can do that can create great impact for gender diversity or gender inclusion, um, especially on the policy side as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, well, we are in the main room, so we're going to we're going to transition. Everybody else is coming back here. I'll have Athanasia speak while we're while everybody else is coming back. Um, but I wanted to say, Bridget, you give you've given us some good question, great questions, and I almost feel like there needs to be a continuing African feminism in AI discussion to try to start addressing some of what you said. Um, Athanasia, let's take advantage of the fact that everybody's coming back and, and hear your, your, your thoughts. If you don't mind everyone else listening as well, over okay. to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Bridget, for the presentation. Uh, it was very enlightening. Um, I actually wanted to talk about two things, but uh, considering the time constraint, I think I would limit myself to just one. And my uh, concern is especially with the embodiment of AI. Uh, we know that uh, as an algorithm, AI itself is gender neutral. And therefore we cannot have a female algorithm, male algorithm. But when it comes to the embodiment of AI, how AI is presented, looks like uh, in that area, we have this whole uh, issue of gender bias. Because in most places, we embody AI in certain ways that tend to objectify women. And I speak uh, specifically and particularly to this whole issue of uh, the proliferation of sex toys. And then when people are just manufacturing these sex toys, it's only women, 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 women. And I think um, talking about um, feminist AI, I'm sure, and I want to believe that that is one of the areas that we should begin to have a conversation on. We, we can and talk about the biases in many ways. 
is a very uh, particular bias we, we need to address uh, as uh, Africans and as African women. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think you're reminding us, uh, well, as many of our speakers and contributors have said, um, AI is very much reflecting a lot of societal biases that we, um, we may not want to carry over. And you're reminding us that as we're working, especially this type of work that's being led um, by the Global South or la launching from the Global South, that there may be sort of, we may have to dig a bit deeper on when we're, we're talking about biases, we tend to look at what are sort of, what's, what are people outside thinking of us and not necessarily what are we thinking about ourselves and what are the subgroups uh, in the diversity space, um, what's happening in that regard. So you're reminding us to, to also do that and maybe um, at some point or maybe on a, at, at the chat, Rachel would we'll love to hear if this has come up um, you know, in, in, the, in the bigger discussion around uh, the Global Index and what, what, what some thoughts were around the sort of looking a bit deeper into um, the biases that exist within the diverse communities um, itself, themselves. So sorry to interrupt um, you, Kuget, because uh, it looks like you were having a really phenomenal discussion, but I see that everyone has been brought back into plenary, and I am very mindful of the time, um, and also just want to thank everyone for bearing with us while we navigated some technical difficulties. Um, but I thought what we could do really quickly is just a very brief report back from each of the facilitators in terms of the kind of key things that came out in your each of your respective discussions that we um, as you know the research ICT team need to consider going forward. And then what we're gonna do um, is launch into a final Menti exercise and I'll hand over to Thule to do the closing. So I'm hoping I will be done only five minutes um, over time. So with that, um, can I perhaps uh, hand over to Arvashi to do a quick report back in terms of the key, key things to note? Thanks Arvashi. Thanks, Kelly. So we had a fantastic presentation from uh, Nandini, and I hope that we'll get a copy of it. Um, she highlighted some of the things that work with the indicators, uh, particularly drew attention to the fact that they highlight both kind of indigenous factors to AI production, um, things like data quality, data governance, so on and so forth, but also uh, exogenous aspects like laws and regulations. Um, a kind of top level question that she had in her presentation was how we are going to think about um, evaluating kind of different value frameworks that governments might have. Uh, so X government might, might prioritize privacy over something else, whereas for another government, maybe having more open access to data is more important. So how do we kind of weigh those when we're ranking these countries that countries just approach might approach these from very different priorities and, and assign different values to them? Um, and then she she kind of uh, brought, brought some great insights from IT for Change's work um, and how one might kind of use those insights to grow the set of indicators that we have. So uh, one point for an example, I'm not going to go through them all because I'm conscious of time, but one was around, you know, how do are we paying enough attention for an example to how the boundaries of AI use have been enacted? So for an example, do we have enough uh, frameworks or legislation around something like uh, gender profile? filing? Um, do we have kind of ex ante audits of AI solutions? Um, similarly, she also pointed out the importance of kind of thinking of multiple value imaginaries. I thought this was really important that like feminism is really about, you know, based on kind of solidarity. So is there space in a country for those alternative imaginations? Um, and maybe an indicator for that could be something like, is does the country have a platform cooperative policy? Does it support community initiatives? So is there in that sense space for those multiple imaginations that could then foster that um, um, solidarity. Um, and then the another point that she raised was around the engagement of these countries on global fora, that we shouldn't just look at kind of domestic policy, but also how they're engaging globally. So the EU's uh, new AI Act, for an example, does protect its own citizens uh, from harm uh, in the production of AI and the rollout of AI, but not really citizens who are, or not really people globally who are 
uh, crucial to the kind of value chain of AI production. So, um, and similarly with domestic, with even countries in the global South, you know, how, for an example, do they engage on global trade for us? So we need to look beyond what is happening in a, in a domestic context as well. So, so some really, really rich remarks from Nandini. And um, yeah, thank you so much for that presentation, Nandini. Wow. That's incredible. It sounds like what a rich um, and robust discussion again, and lo really looking at the layers of, of complexity here. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to take up any more time. Marielle, can you um, provide a quick feedback as well as the, the key outcomes of your conversation? Thanks. Okay. Uh, I will speak in Spanish. Uh, slow. Uh, nosotros, uh, primeramente, Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt just quickly. For those of you who want to listen in English, if you go down to interpretation so you can listen to the report back, just click on um, your preferred language. I'm very sorry to interrupt, Marielle. No problem. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, in nuestro grupo, uh, tuvimos a, como alrededor de 15 personas, pero uh, como, como decía uh, Urvasi, también tuvimos muy poco tiempo y una de las cosas que surgió es que necesitaríamos uh, pensar más sobre eso, uh, es tener un tiempo más uh, largo para uh, madurar la discusión. No pudimos pasar de uno en uno, pensar cada indicador, pero los comentarios generales fueron, uh, primero, que estaría bien uh, que antes el público involucrado, las personas que están aquí hoy, pudieran tener acceso a, a este índice, nuestro índice y, y los otros que son citados para estudiarlos y, y poder uh, opinar con más propiedad. Y también uh, otra cosa interesante que surgió fue uh, la cuestión de los sesgos involuntarios, ¿no? que eso se puede percibir mismo uh, en en la propuesta de este workshop, ¿no? que por ejemplo, uh, que todo esté en inglés y que la tabla de los uh, indicadores esté en inglés ya representa una brecha y una dificultad para que, bueno, desde América Latina y a lo mejor de, de otras regiones, no todas las personas puedan estar incluidas y opinar. ¿no? Y bueno, y Jaime también va a agregar un, un comentario. Gracias. No enciendo la cámara porque tengo un problema de conexión, pero el comentario es en esta línea de, de, de generar o de pensar en algunos de los indicadores con una perspectiva un poco más amplia y no únicamente dirigida hacia los procesos tecnológicos, en particular con, con lo relacionado a las carreras STEM, eh, hay como una sensación de que eh, sobredimensionarlas podría llevar más bien a fortalecer algunos de esos sesgos implícitos y entonces más bien debería de pensarse en mecanismos que garanticen que las carreras tengan una mayor combinación de perspectivas, es decir, no solamente STEM, sino que también incluya ciencia social de modo tal que se puedan adecuar los contenidos, eh, los textos que no solamente estén en inglés, sino que sean producciones localizadas y las temáticas que se abordan desde las ingenierías también que repercutan en las necesidades reales de los países. Y otro comentario que quería mencionar tiene que ver también con la presencia de comunidades marginalizadas, que eso tendría que ser muy bien eh, matizado para que no se caiga en perspectivas asistencialistas que hagan crecer los indicadores, pero que, que no genere un efecto mayor, sino que se piensen en propuestas horizontales y, y de desarrollos dialógicos que realmente den las condiciones para que las personas en condición vulnerable puedan participar activamente y no sean meros espectadores y espectadoras. Muchas gracias. Thank you for that report back. Um, and what again, when I when I think about your report back and your perspectives as compared to the feedback that we're getting from the India session, it just goes to show the importance of having regional representation and influence and um, take your point very seriously about the language. And I think again, it's something that we really need to consider and think of going forward. So um with that, I'm going to hand over to Huguette for the final input, and then and then we'll begin kind of wrapping up. Huguette? Thank you, Kelly. 
we had a great discussion. To me, it felt almost like a family, an extended family meeting where we're talking about us honestly. Um, and so Bridget's presentation was wonderful, even though she talked about being very focused on policy. One thing I noticed throughout the presentation and the questions that were, came up in, in the discussion was that we can't escape uh, culture and social aspects when thinking about um, technology and, and especially AI. One thing that Bridget did was wonderful. She set the stage by reminding us of the contributions to innovation made by African women. So we're not new. This isn't something new for us to contribute to, contribute to innovation. We talked about someone I'd forgotten about, um, Tebo Gang from Botswana with the public health contribution. We talked about Dr. Wangari Mathai with the Greenbelt uh, movement. And then we talked about some of uh, the work that's being done currently by many African uh, women, even though based abroad in the AI space where they've highlighted uh, biases and issues such as one thing that came up was just in terms of the narrative that currently exists when we're looking at data that's out there for, for African women. If you Google, for example, unprofessional hairstyles, it's uh, African women's images that come up uh, in, in Google. So that led us to discussing sort of the type of the data that's currently telling our stories um, that AI is being uh, trained on. Where is that data coming from? These collective spaces, where are they accessing the information they're using to train um, algorithms? That's something that we need to be thinking about as uh, women or African um, in, in, in this space. That also got us to thinking a little bit more about um, aggregated data versus disaggregated data. What are some of the sort of self um, biases that we have that's being reflected back to us uh, with AI? So as we're thinking about the data discussion, there is the broader diverse uh, diversification discussion that's taking place. But if we truly want to see um, a, a diverse and well-trained um, AI, we also need to think about what needs to be done at sort of the local level. So going a bit down and looking at um, what disaggregated data we need to think about, um, how, are, how are policymakers, how are the decisions being made at a policy level in our countries? What data are they considering and what data are they not considering as that will reflect in, um, in the broader picture. Um, of course, along with that came uh, transforming the narrative, whether or not, uh, because we think some of what's being reflected are, of course, the social and, and cultural biases that already exist, what work needs to happen? Um, is it all just going to be, are we expecting those designing and developing AI to do all the work or what else needs to be happening alongside that to ensure that AI really does reflect. So kind of like, can we escape societal biases? Can we make AI um, consider diversity when society isn't yet there, right? That's, that was um, the big question that we put forward. Um, Bridget reminded us uh, also in indicators themselves. So even though we are, it's being launched from the global south, the language is being used to shape the indicators that we're talking about are very much influenced by past work. Um, she called on, well, the, the, the aggregated and disaggregated data was one of the examples. And just, um, you know, thinking about um, if they're being influenced by, by frameworks, it, those, those past frameworks, they didn't, what they did not include, what, what were the gaps that were there that we, we must be considering um, now? Let me just see, I think there was a, another point that was key that I'm not finding. Uh, and then just for, uh, for the work that we need to do in, in terms of whether this index is relevant, um, I think the, the, the agreement was that yes, however, we must figure out a starting point. So as we're talking about, especially to policymakers or developers in this space, it's, it's important to identify low hanging fruit. Where can they start from? If we present them with something this massive, in a way it's ensuring that um, it, it may not move forward just because it's so overwhelming. So really thinking about how, where, you know, how do we present practical um, starting point in, in any of the work related to AI. There were other key questions, but those are some of the points I wanted to highlight to the group. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Huguette. Um, and I actually think that your final point is like the perfect landing pad to, to transition into the Menti exercise. Before we do so, I just want to thank all of the presenters and the facilitators for navigating the technical challenges and, and really managing to have some very robust, regionally relevant, specific conversations that we all need to be listening to and reflecting on and integrating and continuing to evolve this instrument and other spaces and places that we're in. Um, and so um, I just want to thank you all for, for that. And we've noted your, your comments and we'll continue to. But as a final thing, and I am mindful of time, I'm going to share my screen now. We're going to go into our final mentee exercise, which I um, feel even more compelled to not skip this part on the basis of what was just said by Huguette, which is, again, sort of what should the global index prioritize in order to uh, promote feminist AI in the global South? This is key for us. How do we move beyond the kind of the, the framework and actually look at how do we optimize impact and what does that impact look like? look like? Where, where's our starting point? So um, if you can go back into Menti 9890-5215. And again, like I said, we will continue to keep these up. Um, although I am mindful that I think when I stop presenting, they may shut down. But um, I will, um, if you have, like, these are the, these are our key questions. So if you have ideas, please email us, please keep in touch. Um, Tuli will pro provide some additional information about how to continue to influence the conversation going forward. Um, and we're gonna, like I said, um, keep that table um, open and publicly accessible because in many ways, I feel like this should just be the beginning of a longer, of a longer conversation going forward. But I'm seeing here that there's a lot of focus on intersectionality, practicality, capacity building, maldistribution as much as misrecognition is a feminist challenge. That's powerful. It's like also looking at how are, how are the different power differentials influencing the way in which we even conceptualize and understand not only feminism, but the priorities thereof. Um, reparation. Languages, absolutely. Um, simpler communication, academic terms used today were a little confusing for any real representation or, or participation in using accessible language is crucial. Thank you for that feedback. I think this is really, really, again, an, an important. Local idiosyncrasies, governance, growth and participation and decision-making. Again, I'm gonna keep this up, but thank you so much. We're going to take this um, going forward. But with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to Tuli to, to close this out. Thanks, Tuli. Over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this morning slash afternoon for some of you. I know you had other commitments or oh, it's running over, but I'll keep it short. Um, again, uh, it's been posted in the message uh in the chat chat box please reach out to us uh, via email or on our social networks even if it's just to leave a comment um to collaborate with us moving forward but yes i mean like we mentioned before this is a collaborative approach approach that includes everyone and um we will make efforts all efforts to integrate the, the suggestions that have been made so far especially as it relates to the languages and um, having simple explanations for certain things. But yes, we look forward to having you at other collaborations, at other workshops that we will be holding, hosting. Uh, just keep a lookout for those um, invites as they come across your emails. Again, thank you. Have a lovely rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you guys. Sorry. Sorry, quickly, Tuli. Just um, where will they be able to access the table? Um, and how can they? I, I know you put the information in the chat, but I'm also thinking that we should have a follow up, a follow up email that we circulate to all the the participants, which includes the presentations, um, as well as maybe access to the Google Doc. Um, yeah, that sort of information. I'm wondering. Yes, uh, the Google Doc is open and will be left open. We will circulate uh, links um, on our social media. And with those who received invites uh, from Zara, 
Zara will send an email, follow-up email that includes the link to the document. Um, and once again, as you shared the invite with your networks, please feel free to share the document with your networks as well. And everybody can comment on the document and we'll take it from there. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Only 12 minutes over, <laughs> considering all That's of the tech issues. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and um, for bearing with us. And we will we'll continue to keep, um, to keep you all posted. Um, but have a wonderful day further. Um, and take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>